major Cerebon from suite number one is the most concise of all the Cerebons in the suites. It's the only one whose A and B sections consist of exactly eight bars each. Still, there are an awful lot of notes to play here. And I find that in order to capture the sense of pace and flow that we've been talking about with the Cerebon, it's really helpful to extract a simple melody, much like we saw with the surviving notated choreographies. What I've extracted here is certainly not the only possibility. All of Bach's notes are wonderful, and he weaves together harmony and melody so ingeniously that it's really hard to make choices. I've tried to maintain the momentum and energy of the original, and it's a good idea to have something of a baseline in mind so that you are aware of the harmonic rhythm as you go. I feel a pretty strong sense of two plus two in this opening phrase, the second half of the phrase very much responding to what is said in the first half of the phrase. And then this phrase is answered by a more cohesive second four bar phrase. So from here, we can start to add back the other notes, using larger rhythms to contain smaller ones and maintain that larger sense of structure. I always like to start with something fairly straightforward like bars seven and eight. These are basic cadential bars in the key of D major. actually really fun and really freeing and I don't have to play it the same way every time I can really play around with the articulation and the nuance <laughs> Let's go back now to the opening bars in that very characteristic Cerebon rhythmic pattern. This pattern of quarter, dotted quarter, and eighth is a real feature of the G major Cerebon, though it's often heavily embellished and ornamented either on the first beat or the second beat, or both. I find that the early French bowing of down, up, up works well, especially for the simplified version. <laughs> I think it also works really well for the full chords. At a flowing tempo, the motion of the arm from down to up is very fluid and it really gets the cello ringing and the sound of G major resonating. The chords are always rolled from the beat and then how they unfurl is up to you. And then that last little eighth just follows easily. Now bar two is a little bit more complicated it's hard to know what exactly Bach intended. All of the manuscripts look a little bit different. Is that three plus one or one plus three? Both of those are common bowing patterns that we see in Bach's hand in other manuscripts. Or perhaps it's just sloppy copying and what's really intended is a single slur over all four notes. Whichever option I choose most important is that it's a single gesture, it's one chord, it's the dissonant dominant that then releases into the wonderfully ornamented tonic. To practice the three plus one or one plus three option, the two bow gesture, two bows in one gesture, I let the arm weight sink into the down bow, not using too much bow, and then the up bow is just a rebound, like bouncing a ball on the floor. <laughs> It's a nuanced version of all in one bow. And if I do it that way, I simply retake the bow in order to go on with the second half of the phrase. If we compare the opening two bars of the A section to the way that the B section begins, we find something very different. 
It begins with the same rhythmic pattern, but where that downbeat to special second beat was warm and welcoming, G major to C major. Here we have D major going to a quadruple stop dominant chord with the tritone in the upper two strings. And then bar 10 continues that pattern of the dissonance falling on the second beat. The D sharp is what's going to take us to E minor at the end of the phrase. It's interesting here that none of the manuscripts show slurs in bar 9. Perhaps it would have been so obvious to slur those quick notes together that it didn't need to be written down. Certainly this bowing allows for a very convenient down bow to occur on the big chord. On the other hand, a quadruple stop on an up bow, even an intense dissonant one, is not impossible. It becomes a question of personal taste and preference, and perhaps technical comfort. These are subtle nuances that impact the way we say things, the articulation we use, but not fundamentally what we're saying. As we continue to work in this way, bringing back the notes into our larger structure, our simplified form, there are a number of places in particular where it's easy to become a little overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of notes and to feel as if playing at this quicker tempo isn't such a great idea. We find these on the elongated special second beats and the wonderful embellishments and scales that arise out of them. There's a tendency to want to really land on the second beat to make it a point of arrival. But then everything that follows is necessarily a new gesture, kind of pick up to the next bar. But now I've interrupted my phrase, I've made kind of a big deal out of the third beat, and I've likely lost a lot of tempo. There's no question but that that rising scale of 16th notes is going forward. I couldn't stop it if I tried. But at the same time, it's coming out of the second beat. It's G major, the same chord. Our harmonic rhythm is quarter, half, strong, special. Using all these tools and ideas that we've been talking about, I have found that I can comfortably and hopefully expressively play this G major sarabande at about a quarter note equals 60. It's very slow tempo for a dancer, but it's not undanceable. Mm -hmm.